Hello everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so my pr presentation focuses on the role of the concept of human rights due diligence in fostering corporate accountability. Um, Okay. Human rights due diligence is a key concept of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and what it is basically the blueprints of the steps that multinational corporations uh, need to take in order to discharge their uh, corporate responsibility to respect human rights. Um, now, as we know, the, one of the main limitations of the guiding principles uh, lie in the fact that they are non-binding. But what we have seen is various initiatives at the national level to try and give teeth to the uh, concept of human rights due diligence um, and transform them into harder-edged legal duties. And these are these initiatives that I want to explore here with you. Um, they are in, of two types in particular. The first step um, emerged from case law, and in particular civil litigation, and the second type uh, from the legislators. So looking at um, human rights due diligence and civil litigation to uh, begin with, here I'm going to talk about, um, focus on two cases only, given the time constraints, which um, is a Dutch case and an English case. Um, and this case is involve the liability of the parent company for the acts and omissions of their subsidiaries. So starting with the UK, um, so I'm going to talk about the Vedanta case, which is a very recent case, concerning proceedings that were brought in England by Zambian residents against an English company, so against both the English parent company and the Zambian subsidiary for the damage that they had suffered as a result of the environmental pollution caused by discharges from a copper mine that was owned and operated by the uh, subsidiary. In particular, the claimants were uh, sustaining that the pollution of the waterways had affected their livelihoods um, because they relied on these waterways as their primary source of clean water for bathing, for cooking, um, for cleaning, for irrigation of the crops, uh, for finding fresh fish, etc. Um, one of the preliminary issues that arose in that case was the one of jurisdiction. Now, in particular, the claim against the parent company was uh, brought on the basis of uh, the Recast Brussels uh, Regulation, which um, uh, provides in Article 4 that person domiciled in member state shall be um, sued in that member state. The claims um, against the Zambian subsidiary, on the other hand, uh, were brought on the basis of English law, and in particular paragraph 3.1 of the Practice Direction 6B, which basically um, allows claims to be served out of the jurisdiction with the permission of the court, where there is between the claimant and the defendant a real issue to be, to be tried, and um, where the claimant wishes to serve, wishing to serve the claim which is to say the claim um, against um, another person who is a necessary or proper party to that claim. So in other words, what um, that disposition entails is basically it potentially enables claims against non-EU domiciled uh, definants to be brought and to be tried in England to, together with claims against EU domiciled definants when uh, these two conditions are fulfilled. So the defendants were arguing that, in fact, the claimants were, by uh, relying on this um, legislation, were abusing procedural law because, in fact, the claim against the parent company had just, no, just didn't have any chance of uh, being successful. Um, the High Court held that the claimants could bring their case in the UK. The definite appeal on the ground that the entire focus of the case was in Zambia, so this is where um, the alleged tort was committed, the damage occurred, this is where the uh, claimants reside, uh, this is where the subsidiary is domiciled, and Zambian law was the law applicable. And so they, therefore, um, the definites were submitting that Zambia would be a more appropriate forum to hear the claim. Um, they also said 
that the claim against the parent company was just an illegitimate hook being used to permit the claims to be brought in the UK, which would otherwise have nothing to do with the UK. The claimants, on the other hand, sustained that there was a real issue between themselves and the parent company, and also that access to justice issues in Zambia would, in any case, um, suggest that the case should be tried in the UK. So in order to decide on these issues, the judge had to decide on the likelihood that the um, uh, that a duty of care would be owed by the parent company to the claimants um, for the acts of its subsidiary. Um, in order to demonstrate the existence of a duty of, of care, the claimants used various elements, and one of them were um, um, the, the various public statements that the parent company had made regarding its commitment to address environmental risks um, and the technical shortcomings of the subsidiary mining operation in Zambia. When um, analysing the well-established case law on establishing the um, duty of care of the parent company, Lord Justice Simon, who was uh, the judge of the, in the Court of Appeal, um, found that the claim against the parent company was arguable. So he looked at all the um, threefold tests established in the Capar case. He looked at the um, indicia from the uh, Chandler case and the various case law. And obviously this was just a preliminary issue, so he didn't give an answer on the substantial um, facts of the case, but simply said that there was a serious question to be tried which should not be disposed of summarily. Um, oops. Now moving on to, I'll come back to that case in a little bit, moving on to the Netherlands. Here we'd like to talk about the Shell case in uh, the Netherlands. This case concerns disputes that arose um, out of oil spills which resulted in environmental damage that affected wide areas of lands and water as well as the health and livelihood of the local communities in the Niger Delta. As a result of which, four Nigerian fishermen and farmers brought a claim in the Netherlands for compensation against Shell. Again, similarly, issues of jurisdiction arose. The claim against the parent company was just, just as in the Vedanta case, based on, well, this and the Brussels one regulation, the old one. Um, and the claim against a Nigerian subsidiary was based on Dutch law, Dutch national law, and in particular Article 7 of the Dutch Code of Civil Procedure, which allows connected claim to be heard by the same form. So not dissimilar to the one to the English law um, that I mentioned earlier. Again, here Shell was um, sustaining that the claimants were abusing procedural law and uh, that their strategy of bringing the claim against a parent company was actually just a device that was used cynically uh, to bring claims that would otherwise have just no connection whatsoever with the European territory. And they were arguing that the claims against a parent company were bound to fail. So again, the judge had to decide on the likelihood that the parent company um, could be, uh, that a claim against a parent company could be awarded. Um, the claimants sustained in particular in support of their claim that uh, the parent company exercised a high degree of control and direction over the Nigerian subsidiary, that it owed them a duty of care, and be, that he had breached that duty of care by failing to ensure that the oil leaks were uh, effectively cleaned up, and by failing to take appropriate measures to address what they considered was a well-known systemic problem of its operations in Nigeria. Now, in first instance, the Dutch Forum rejected the claims against the parent company um, on the grounds that, under Nigerian law, there was no general duty of care on parent companies to prevent their subsidiaries from inflicting damage on others uh, through their business operations. But in a very interesting decision of the Court of, of, of Appeal of The Hague um, on the 18th of December 2015, the court reversed that decision and said that it couldn't be ruled out in advance that a parent company may in certain circumstances be liable uh, for damages resulting from acts and omissions of its subsidiary. Um, the Court of Appeal said that considering the foreseeable serious consequences of the oil spills 
from the local for, to the local environment from a potential spill source. It couldn't be ruled out that the parent company would be expected to take an interest in preventing the spills. But I think that's the most interesting point of the decision here. It added, the more so if the company has made the prevention of environmental damage by the activities of group companies a spearhead and is to a certain degree actively involved in and managing the business operations of uh, the companies. So here it's particularly interesting to see how the voluntary commitments adopted by Shell is used against them um, and the parent company's duty of diligence is somewhat enhanced by this corporate social act, um, uh, responsibility commitments voluntarily accept, ad adopted by the parent company. Um, the Court of Appeal then went on to ask a number of questions that should be taken into consideration in uh, the substantive, um, when deciding on the substance of the case. Um, looking at the standards that are expected from the company for in the, uh, the parent com expected from the parent company in the monitoring of the activities of the subsidiary and what we see in this different test is a very high threshold that is expected from the parent company um, and the court to conclude that it couldn't be ruled out that the parent company couldn't be liable for damages resulting from the conduct of its subsidiary and that the claims against the parent company and the uh, Nigerian subsidiary were closely connected and therefore should be heard together. Um, so here we see a very different, um, sorry, a, a quite a similar decision that, it, that the one that was taken in the Vedanta case in the UK. It is, however, in sharp contrast with the English case uh, on, on shells on the same facts, but this is a case brought by over 42,000 Nigerian citizens against Shell for the environmental damage caused by the oil spill, and that was brought in the UK. Now, in that case, the case in the UK case, um, the High Court had considered that the parent company did not owe a duty of care to the claimants. In particular, Justice Fraser. Uh, found that the freefall test that was set out in the Caparo case, in particular with regards to foreseeability, proximity and reasonableness, was just not satisfied. That the relationship between the um, ultimate, what they call the ultimate holding company, and the claimants was just not a close one, and that the subsidiary, uh, the parent company was not better placed by the, than the subsidiary in respect of the harm, um, and therefore that it wasn't fair to infer that um, because of that feature, the subsidiary would rely upon the parent company to avoid the harm. So on um, the 14th of February 2018, so very recently, the Court of Appeal rejected the claimant's appeal in that case in the UK, um, with the majority opinion uh, say, stating that the claim against the parent company were bound to fail and that it was just not arguable that the parent company owed them a duty of care. So same reasoning that um, the one, the same conclusion that the one that Justice Fraser had reached but through a different reasoning here, which um, Amnesty International warned that was a potentially uh, setting a very uh, potentially dangerous precedent inviting a UK-based corporations do uh, have free reign to abuse human rights overseas. It also completely um, deny the economic reality of the um, unity of the various entities of multinational corporations by just focusing and strictly adhering to the separation of the legal uh, personality principles. And in my opinion, perhaps even more importantly, it negates the regulatory functions of European courts as home states forum. Now, um, I'm running out of time, so I will just briefly mention, because earlier I mentioned there are two initiatives, the case law initiatives and the uh, legislative initiatives to, get, to reinforce, to make um, human rights due diligence mandatory. And this is just, I wanted to briefly mention the French uh, law on the duty of diligence, which requires large French multinational corporations to put in place make public and implement um, a vigilance plan in order to identify risks and prevent serious harms to human rights and the environment. And this is very in in interesting law because it imposes these due diligence responsibilities on parent company 
not only in relation to their subsidiaries, but also in relation to their suppliers, and they must, in order to make sure that they adhere to responsible business standards wherever they operate. So what we've been seeing through that, this case law that I presented and, and through this legislation, I just mentioned the French one, but there is a similar Swiss uh, initiative going on at the moment, is a shift from soft law to hard law um, in order to make uh, human rights due diligence uh, more meaningful and improve um, corporate accountability. Thank you very much.